Oh, here we go. So yeah, I will be, my name is Jace Clayton. I make music and mix records as DJ Rupture, um, something I've been doing for, for a while now. And I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then I'm going to hop on the, the turntables, three turntables set up with the mixer that was in Kevin's um, image earlier. And uh, just to, to, I'm going to basically talk about what the figure of the DJ is and why I find it resonant. Um, and as a, as a means of introduction into that, I should say I first decided to become a DJ um, back in Boston. Uh, I was first inspired to become a DJ back in Boston, going to a sort of after-hours club called The, the Loft. And on one floor there was house, and on another floor there was techno, and then they started playing this drum and bass jungle, new music from new music from England in it. And in that second floor, when I first heard jungle, um, first of all I was amazed by the music. You know, I had never heard anything like it. And on that big sound system, it was just immediately physical. It was music that referenced elements of hip hop, elements of reggae, elements of all sorts of breakbeat culture and sound system culture. But it was all sped up and mutated and. Uh, and, and just, you know, really struck me. And there was even this sort of thing where it was very fast drum, drumming on top, but then sort of halftime bass line. So you could dance to the fast version or dance to the slow version. It seemed just very, very like a plural sound. And for me as, you know, like a young kid <coughs> dancing, it was, it was just, you know, blew my mind. And that particular room, I don't know if I was never looking hard enough, but it was really hard to see the DJs. I never knew where the DJs were. Um, they were totally not foregrounded. It wasn't the sort of thing like you get with a rock band on stage doing a performance. It was you go in that room and somewhere there was music, you know, and there would be about an hour of jungle in the middle of each night. And, and apart from that, you wouldn't even know who the DJs were. It was just shifting sounds, shifting sounds floating in the air um, in darkness and bodies. And that, that was about it. And as I look back at it now, that was actually, it's a really kind of important way to think about the DJ, the figure of the DJ, almost as a, as a filter or a, a navigator of culture, and not at all about, this is me, you know, this is me, this is the author, here I am, look at me. It's just, we're sort of in this slipstream. And so when I think about the DJ, you know, I think about it, it's this a sort of, it's like an antagonistic prefix, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, marks a certain confusion. You know, first off, the, this DJ, it, it means, you know, it's not like, I'm, I don't perform as rupture, and I don't perform as Jace Clayton, it's DJ Rupture. And the vast majority of DJs put this DJ in front. You know, it be originally began as disc jockey, but I think it signifies a sort of cultural confusion and a recognition that, yeah, it's like we're not, you know, the, the capital A, the modernist author. You know, this isn't my great work. I didn't necessarily write any of the music I'm using in a mix. And not only that, but, but we're, we're fine with that. You know, authorship isn't important. It's not that kind of cultural production or cultural processes. Um, and another, another one of the things that was really, the point is really driven home is DJing, a DJ doesn't really produce a product so much <coughs> as a process. You know, some people say, oh, you know, I got this DJ, I got the DJ Rupture CD, or some people would say, oh, I only see DJs live. But it's really kind of unclear what it is exactly a DJ makes, you know, is my performance, um, I, the best example I can give of this is I kind of first became an international DJ in 2001 when I put together a mix CD called Gold Teeth Thief. I've been living in Madrid, Spain for a while and I went home to sort of visa issues and so I was buying all these new records, I was at my parents' house and I sat down and I made this mix using three turntables and a lot of new music and just a lot of enthusiasm and I ended up putting it online just so that friends could listen to it, that friends could download it. Um, and then I started sending links to some of the musicians whose music I'd put, you know, and so it was online with, you know, my name, the DJ Rupture, Gold Teeth Thief, here's the track list. You know, 44 songs, 60 minutes, and then all these different people. Um, and I was never expecting anyone outside of my circle of friends to, to hear it, um, but, you know, one magazine found it and started writing it up, and then other magazines, and then it sort of started snowballed and kind of, you know, went viral, as, as people say. <coughs> And soon, you know, a lot of people were listening to the mix and downloading it and talking about it. And eventually, I hadn't even intended to make uh, a CD or anything sellable from it, but eventually stores started writing me saying, hey, you know, we'd like to order 100 copies. People, we'd love, you know, this is really interesting. You're putting together the sorts of music we hadn't heard before. And for me, I'd always, you know, I'd made mixtapes just to sell the, you know, give away or sell to friends, but it was almost a, it was like a double-edged sword because I was there in Spain with a very slow four-speed CD burner. So every time, you know, a store was like, we'd want all these copies, I'm like, oh no, I need to, 
go to the shop and buy jewel cases and then spend hours and hours switching the CD players and it was just this sort of ridiculous thing. But many, many DJs are in this, as Aram and others have mentioned, you know, DJ drama, endless DJs. It's, it's uh, one of the biggest distinctions in terms of, of the product we produce is that it's, it's so often inhabits this weird legal gray area of, of the DJ and of the DJ producer. Um, and, and another aspect I like about this, the, the DJ prefix is that to some people it, it connotes extreme laziness. You know, and it, it brings in the question like, is this DJ, is it a talent? Is it a skill? Is it something merely technical? And, and again, I think it's, it, the culture of the DJ accepts that ambiguity. You know, you can be an iPod DJ, the person who just, you know, or, or, or put on Pandora, the algorithmic DJ. Um, and in fact, there are moments of this sort of extreme laziness where it flips over and goes into brilliance. I always like to talk about DJ Screw, who was a RIP DJ Screw. He was a, a, a DJ in Houston, Texas. Um, and in the 90s, he started putting out mixtapes but his mixtapes weren't, the main thing that distinguished his mixtapes from all the other hip hop music out there was simply that it was slowed down. So you know, in the first DJ Screw CD I heard was in fact a Tupac album, start to finish in the same sequence, just slowed way down. And that was it, and my friend was playing it for me, you know, when it was sometime mid to late 90s, and I was like, you know, the first track I was like, okay, it's a slow Tupac song, interesting. And then, you know, the second track, I'm like, another slow Tupac song, and then the third track, it all clicked. I'm like, wait, this song, suddenly, the, the mere act of being that pushing down the pitch, slowing down the song, suddenly gave it a completely different cast. You know, the voice becomes viscous and muddy, the beats, the tuning of the song changes and morphs. And on certain songs, it didn't really hit, but when it did hit, I was like, this is brilliant. You know, this is real work. And that's screw, and that's the example of sort of DJ logic doing a subtle shift to a song, which suddenly, not even changing the context, you know, it, Tupac is saying everything he's saying, all the notes are being played, they're just much slower. Um, so again, that's one of these weird moments of what, you know, what is a DJ, or what does a DJ create? And another thing I think of, when I think of the DJ is, as, as a, a moment of cultural creation, it's never, at least for me, it's never about again, me being on stage and broadcasting my capital M message to the people, I think a good DJ and, and what makes DJs, what makes people you know, become you know, fans of DJs and follow DJs and, and go out to DJ nights is that there's always this element of communication and, and a symbiotic relationship with the audience. You know, it's, in a sense, DJing is, as much as it is playing music and stringing together songs and, and sounds, it is going into a very specific room filled with very specific bodies and trying to engage with them. And of course, you know, the DJ is the person who has final say, but if someone is only there saying, this is what I want to hear right now, boom, and you're going to hear it, then that's going to turn people off, and that's going to push people away. So at, its, at their best, a DJ is kind of creating a space, a space of community, you know, and so I approach it personally thinking of, well, I want, you know, I have my musical ideas, I have the song, songs I love, but I know that if I play you know, this crazy weirdo track in the beginning, then it's going to turn people off and sort of push people away. And so it's this very interesting kind of give and take relationship between not, um, but yeah, between, I, I think of it in terms of trust, between establishing lines, saying, okay, well, you, you know, maybe this song is a familiar track, you've heard it before, maybe this is a remix, or maybe I'm taking a cappella, but it's something that will get the overall mass of people moving, and then once you've got that momentum, I could like to take things further and further and further and sort of see where I can go with it. Um, and, and all of that is, is, again, it's not, you know, a DJ on, stand, on stage playing back certain songs, this is what we do, this is what we do, it's saying, okay, Let's talk. Let's try and create something together through the course of the night. And of course, that always involves reacting to other songs that we've played before, other types of music, the overall arc of energy. It's, it's very much, um, it's almost like a, it's not a servant position, but there's something, there's something very, I think, sort of giving about, about the DJ and something, and not, it's not necessarily humble per se, but not, again, the sort of modernist arrogance that you get in a lot of production, composition, you know, this is my novel, funk, this is my album, funk. Um, one of the things, reasons I think that now, um, for example, Ram's fantastic speech ended with this idea of DJ consciousness, um, and he touched on a lot of the reasons why that's really relevant. Um, and for me, it's a beautiful thing to see is that a lot of the, the ways in which DJs have been thinking about culture are slowly moving into the mainstream. 
um, as many people have noted. You know, and so at the very basic level, you know, a DJ, we're living at a time of information overload. There's too much noise, too many things approaching us. And so you want, everyone needs a filter. And not only that, um, you know, so DJs and bloggers and many other analogs for different types of filter, but not only that, you, you don't just want, you know, a certain line through a noise, you want a stylized line. You want someone who can take a narrative through this path of, of sounds and chaos and build some sort of, some sort of sense out of it, you know, and to try, to try and tell a story with it or try and suggest possibilities or take a historical line. And so at, at, their, at its best, again, the DJ is, is a figure for someone who is saying, okay, there's all this different types of cultural products and cultural processes and all these vectors, but let's see if I can enter into that and move, it, move in it in an interesting way. Not necessarily creating per se, but you know, taking a stylized path through all this information. And, and that's uh, another thing I think of when I think of the DJ ethos. A lot of people will talk about mashup culture. You know, and people mention Girl Talk and or the Grey Album and Danger Mouse. And for me, those are all nice examples of a very particular sliver of what DJ culture is. Because in nearly all those examples, there are people who become famous because they've taken different types of pop music and multiplied it by other types of pop. You know, and, and it's great. You know, it's like Girl Talk and Danger Mouse and all those people are doing interesting work. And yet, it's to me, if the question is only like, are, are we, am I allowed to remix the Eminem song? Am I allowed to take a Nicki Minaj a cappella and put it on my beat? It's really, you know, are we allowed to take the, the gifts from the major labels and reformat them and do what we want? It's really kind of missing the point and becomes a very, in a way, a very almost drab and, and reactionary type of thing. And so, so again, in my sort of idealistic way, when I think of the DJ ethos, I think back to, to DJing's roots, you know, in the South Bronx, war-torn, battle-scarred, massively underfunded New York City of the late 70s, where, um, you know, cool, cool Herc, this Jamaican selector, a Jamaican sound system guy who, who was, was there, he was trying to play reggae music, you know, you know, to people in the Bronx, to blacks and Latinos and various people in the Bronx, and they weren't really feeling it, but he was a Jamaican, he wanted it to work. And so he started bringing in all sorts of other types of music. And this interesting moment again of, I say what I say is the give and take. You know, he had to abandon his roots of music and what he was most excited about and try and find corners of his record, record collection that both excited him and could relate to his new audience he found in New York City. And so all throughout the, the early years of hip hop culture, there's this, there's this, there's this um, great competitive aspect of it where DJs would be searching to find the most obscure record, the record that only they had access to, that only they knew about, with the most obscure breakbeat on it, the most obscure section where there's just these drums, which the dancers love to, to dance to, you know, and, and then play it. But it's this moment of finding obscure, valuable information that would then speak to, to the people at hand, you know, that would then sort of have this populist underpinning. And so again, like that to me is, is one of the, I mean, there are various cores of the DJ, and it's a very, it's a very kind of hazy concept, but that is one of the cores. It's not just making people dance, like anybody can do that. And it's not just playing the new remix of the new song, the XXXX, pop, 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 whatever, that's not interesting. But trying to find a line through things, trying to look back, it's almost like an archival work, thinking that here's this crazy song, which a lot, maybe not a lot of people have heard, but I've found it, or I've discovered it. Or here's some song, which in and of itself might not be doing it for me, but when I layer it with something else, or when I play it after these seven other songs, at particularly the right moment of the night, people are going to hear that piece of, piece of music, piece of recorded history in a new light and relate to it in a new way um, and, and find themselves moving to it, find themselves understanding it both at an intellectual level and a corporeal level. Um, so that's, that's uh, yes, the DJ ethos. And so perhaps, you know, I'm going to... I'm going to put on pause now and, and go do a little DJing. It's kind of weird because, like I said in the beginning of Boston, you know, I was into this idea of the DJ as the faceless person who's just there in the club, and then you know, here 10 years later, I'm sort of standing up and then talking about it. But yeah, so I'm going to do a little bit, a brief little bit of DJ mixing, and then come back and talk a bit more. And what I'm, what I'm going to do here is, I should say, the, the basic sort of skill set of any DJ is I would say is beat matching, which is when you get two records at slightly different tempos or beats per minute, and you sync them up so that they can so that they're playing in the same time, the same time signature, so they become synced. And then once you've got records beat matched, you can then 
fade from one to another seamlessly to keep the, you know, if you've got any bit in nightclub, it's been that same boom, boom beat all night long. That's because someone somewhere was working to get these different tempoed songs sort of har har harmonized so you could flow from one to another. And that's kind of the, that's, yeah, that's the essential. And from, from there, you get so many other different ways, you know. Like this, this basic mixer, you know, it has EQs, there's a crossfader, different, different, um, different ways of adjusting the sound. And this particular one I use has all these effects built in. But DJing as such, it's evolved from a very, very basic set, setup where it'd be people literally like <coughs> rewiring, you know, whole mixers so that they can do these things like opening up the top and going in with screwdrivers to these highly customized mixers which are, you know, designed very much with DJ culture in mind and with people recombining them recombining things, but essentially, you know, I'm using a, I'll be using a bunch of records. Some of, some of the sounds are mine, some of the sounds are other people, to do a quick, you know, five or five, six, seven minute blend. And there'll probably be a lot of music you haven't heard, and, and, and some Motown in there, I think, and a few other things. Anyhow, here we go.
rather than the norm. You know, the norm is remix. The norm is fluidity, hybridity, influence, impurity. That's, in a, in a sense, that's all there is. And so in those, in those few other moments when you get, you know, the RIA giving people ridiculous claims, ridiculous lawsuits, and these types of things, that indicates, if, if nothing else, that indicates a lot of legal and economic and sort of infrastructural power that's creating this and stamping it into place. But the norm is taking these sounds and unspooling them into new creations. And so briefly, um, one of the records, the beat I used was this, you know, it says Chrome Star Shockwave EP. And this is, it's, a, it's called a white, it's called a white label or a test pressing. And this is an interesting example of, it's, it's technically it's a dubstep record, you know, from British club music. I got it maybe five years ago. 
And at the time, dubstep wasn't that big of a business. You know, there wasn't that much people infrastructure around it. And so the most of the records you got were these expensive but white labels, only for DJs, sold with the understanding with very little information, like almost no information. And sold with the understanding that they're music made by DJs for other DJs to be mixed in clubs to crowds of people. You know, like it's like normal people wouldn't really get these. But as dubstep has gotten bigger and bigger, it's become increasingly harder to find white labels. And now when you get them, you're missing you know, copyright owners, this is that, the other thing. But this is sort of a relic from a sort of a looser days of a, of a virgin club genre. And this, one of the other records, the Motown, Standing in the Shadows of Love, Four Tops. This is another nice one. A few years ago, it's an apocryphal story about Leave it, Believe It's True. A few years ago, a DVD was issued about Motown, and it had footage of people in recording booths singing songs you know, with, with, no, with no musical accompaniment. And so people, of course, someone out there, some enterprising DJ, pressed that on vinyl and put it out. And so it's all Motown acapella, Standing the Shadows of Love, My World's Empty Without You, all sort of gray market, semi-legit, but again, exclusively for the use of DJs. Who else is going to want to listen to this stuff? And then the same with this uh, Bill Medee that did a little bit, uh-oh, a really nice record that came out several years ago. But on this side of the record, it's instrumental a cappella, and on the other side, it's main. And then all the other records I used, I think, were more, more or less normal records, but the whole point, not strictly intended for DJ use, but the whole point of DJing is, is that you take these things and you you, uh, you, you, you spin them into a new existence, you know? And so what I was doing there, really briefly, like I said, was beat matching and blending, superimposing the acapella so it was on, in time with the beat, putting on some effects, some echo and some delay. You know, I was also going a bit more into the school of turntablism, which, again, it's interesting. The turntable began as strictly a playback, you know, sort of one-way one -way device. You would buy the record, you'd put it on your phonograph player, you'd listen to it. And then as DJ culture began in the late 70s, people started realizing, oh, hey, you know, if we build mixers, people can, instead of just playing back records, they can do all sorts of things. And those particular turntables, they're, I think they're, the design came out in 1975, but they're, they're made for radio. And the thing is, they're very, 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 very strong motor inside, so it was able to do things like backspin records. So as the record's playing normally, you can put your hand on it, pull it back, and start doing scratching, or pausing, and cueing, doing all these manipulations to this, you know, to this physically coded sound. Um, and so the turntable itself is moving from only a playback device to something which is saying, okay, this is a creative tool. And so it was a bit hard to hear on these, this system, which I was overloading with the bass, but I started, at some point I was just tapping the record a bit. And so then I'm thinking, okay, this is a record with sound on it, but if you just bang the record, the vinyl record with a needle on it, that can also be used as a percussion instrument. And so again, it's one of these, it's, you know, you can call it hacking, or you can call it playing, but once these, these cultures evolve, they can just keep on going to so many different ways to interact, interact with sound. Um, so that's, again, I'll fast forward a little bit DJ, DJ instruction on um, what DJ might be, you know. But essentially, it's what began as music um, only for playback has evolved, evolved, evolved into something that's, you know, spiraling out. And this, again, Aram mentioned the double consciousness, and I actually like to take it back a bit further than that. I like to, 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 to begin with, with slavery. <laughs> and so it's, it's this moment of, if you're thinking about any type of property, you know, any type of cultural expression here in, this, here in America particularly, um, to me it's sort of like ground zero for a lot of these cultural forms which are questioning ideas of ownership, ideas of originality, ideas of authenticity. Um, to me, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a tragically beautiful thing to think about, you know, to go back to Africa and think about, you know, millions of black people being taken, severed from everything, everything that was home, everything that was familiar, you know, complete dispossession, language, nation, history, religion, social structures, and suddenly taken to, to a radically different world um, where none of that was, was, was at all operative, um, all sorts of violence, unimaginable violence, and not only that, it's along with along with all those sort of all those violences. There's a sudden thing of now you are an object. Now you are owned. Something that can be owned. Um, and and so I think that there's a I see a, a kind of a, an undercurrent of deep seated deep, deep seated critique and deep seated distance from ideas of authorship. 
in a lot of cultures that I see it's kind of emerging from that or have even have sympathetic resonances with that. But again, it's it's thinking of, you know, who in a sense who, you know, I not trying to talk about any sort of exceptionalism, but there were there were very specific cultures who were faced very critically with ideas of ownership and dispossession. And at, at a point I was thinking, well, it's you know, is this person a property? Is this person does this person have humanity? What is it? And so when you think about the cultural forms that, that emerge from that, you know, of course a lot of music and different forms are going to be based around ideas about improvisation, ideas about performance rather than selling, you know, and just like an inherent hostility to or sort of structural antagonism to a lot of legal systems around it. You know, and so talking about, you know, black music or Afro-American musical forms and derivatives of, you know, you can go back and say, look at look at, you know, jazz of course, with, you know, this emphasis on improvisation and emphasis on sort of you know, like an insider complexity as being related to that. Um, you look at gospel, which is almost like a communal musical form where people will be you know, where it's non-professional, you know, where it's related to a very specific social community with a very specific social function. And and then you can look at it, again, I think a shiny example of this is uh, DJ Screw, who I mentioned earlier. His combination of both laziness and brilliance, you know, he's this guy who's been historically dispossessed. You know, he's living in a rough, rough and tumble section of Houston. And he's both being sort of philosophically genius by slowing down these songs and committing to it. And he's saying, well, I'm in this capitalist system, so, you know what, I'm gonna sell these mixtapes. I'm gonna take this thing, of which I've done fairly minimal adjustments to, and put it out there, sell it one-to-one, -one, sell it to the people who come up and drive up to my house. Um, so these little sort of micro-capitalisms, but based on this huge distrust and almost like a, not even a disrespect for a lot of the ways in which we think about copyright and ownership, but thinking that, you know, that system hasn't applied for, for many, many people all over the world, from many, many different points of history, that system either didn't exist or was actively hostile to their own best interests. And so I think of DJ culture as being one of many examples where if you step back and take the historical long view, a lot of the kind of very contemporary debates about fair use, about copyright, and similar things uh, take on a whole different, a whole different cast. Um, and you can see almost the sort of the, the, the transience of this moment, you know, which I, I, at the once it, you know, it, it encourages us to, to advocate for ways in which things, to, to, to us to stay visionary and to advocate for ways in which things can and should be different. Um, but it's also, you know, it's, it's, um, it's all, you know, I feel like it's all an aspect of the mix. You know, it's all part of this spinning, part of this notion, of a much greater notion that I believe in quite strongly that music is a social act, that it's never something that anyone does in isolation, of course, any sort of meaning that's going to come from that is a communally generated meaning. And while as much as you have uh, the nodal points of focus, you know, Kanye West's and Billy Joel's and, the, and you know, the country music stars and everybody in general, what gives it, what makes it such an intimate ground for us to think about ideas about identity, ideas about law, ideas, ideas about pleasure, ideas about um, ownership, is because music is so intimate. And it is something, you know, it's very abstract nature, it means that it's something that each one of us can grab and hold close.